communication with children, what we're going to talk about when we talk about relationships next. How parents communicate with children, we believe, through this extensive scientific synthesis that we've done, shapes the development of the prefrontal cortex. Well, thanks, Rich. And I think it's wonderful you're having this uh, subject covered. You know, it's an extremely important um, question how therapists can use not only neuroscience, but all the branches of science as a foundation for their work. Um, and so it's, I think it's great that you're doing this, so thank you. Uh, you know, in the assessment phase, what's really crucial uh, is to realize that a psychotherapist, someone who is a therapist in the field of mental health, is actually assessing the mind. Uh, and the mind is not the same as the brain. Uh, so while we're going to look at neuroscience, it would be really, I think, a serious mistake to think that a psychotherapist is a brain therapist uh -huh. um, because we are not neurologists. Neurologists are wonderful people doing important work, but we are people in the field of psychotherapy, of mental health, not brain health. So in the assessment phase, uh, this first part you, you're asking that we talk about, it's really important that a therapist realize that as a member of the field of mental health, we have these two words, mental and health. And so from the perspective that um, I and my colleagues work from, it called interpersonal neurobiology, we see the mind as this process that's both embodied, so it's more than just what's up in the head and the brain, but it's the whole body. Uh, and we also see it as not just embodied, but it's also relational. So, you know, the experience that we have in the assessment phase is going to be fundamentally exploring the mind because as a mental health practitioner, you will be actually looking at the relational experience that emerges and trying to tease apart different aspects of the embodied experience, all within the framework of the subjective life of the client, of the patient, which means mm -hmm. their inner felt sense. Mm -hmm. It means the kind of thinking they have. It means their mood. It means their attitude, their hopes, their dreams, their longings, their intentions. All of that subjective inner mental stuff is the essence of what we look for. One time he comes in and he says, I just got to tell you something that happened. I said, what happened? He goes, you know, we had, we had these friends over for dinner and we were having dinner. It was fine. And I started just feeling really, really depressed. And I don't ever remember feeling anything like that. And my, mm -hmm. our friends left and I went to my wife and I've never done this before. And I said, I need to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And she, I was like, but what? Because that's not how he talked, you know. He goes, I just am feeling something really bad. And she goes, what are you feeling? Goes, he goes, I don't know. It's like I got this heaviness here, and I, I just, I guess I feel like I want to cry. I, I don't know. She goes, well, what's going on? So he pauses, and he and I had all, all this talk in our, you know, developing his right hemisphere. We talked about the mirror neuron system, which I really call the sponge neuron system, where you sponge in the feelings of other people and sponging their behaviors and stuff. So he was talking about these sponge neurons, the mirror neurons. And he said, I said to my wife, oh my God, I realize our friend just told us he was diagnosed with cancer and they, did, they only gave him three months to live. And I realize how ho hopeless I feel for him, how helpless he feels because his cancer is so progressed mm -hmm. and how sad, sad I feel. And he starts to cry in the office here with mm -hmm. me telling me about telling his wife about these feelings and he goes and then I thought to myself it's the mirror neurons my mirror neurons were sponging in my friend's pain and this is his pain not mine so I can stay with it because it's about his sadness and his predicament and it sort of lifted me up and the depression started lifting and I started actually feeling okay I felt really really sad for him I could feel how much he's, he's, he's saying all this to you. Yeah, yeah. he's saying this yeah. to me. He right. goes, and then the evening was fine after that with my wife. 
-hmm. Instead of feeling depressed, I just felt sad for my friend. Instead of just being oppressive, I felt kind of the clarity of being incredibly grateful for life. And this mm -hmm. was part of the integration of consciousness. He could see that from understanding the sponge neurons, the mirror neurons, that it was a point on his rim, and that's what he talked about. And from his hub, he could be open to the incredible mystery of life and the majesty of being able to just be present for whatever arises, which is the integration of consciousness. And in the bilateral stuff, for the first time ever, he went to his wife from an interpersonal integration point of view and said, mm -hmm. I'm feeling something different from you, but I'm feeling something that I don't understand. You, my wife of 65 years, you can help me explore this yeah. thing that feels really bad. And then all this empathy started emerging. This guy became like this maven of mindsight, you know, seeing the mind in the self of others. And to this day, years and years later, he's still that way. We define the mind beyond consciousness and non-consciousness, beyond subjective experience. We define it as a self-organizing, which means it's an emergent property of a complex system. It's self-organizing embodied and relational process so it's both in the body not just in the head and it's also in relationships it's both and that it's regulating something it's regulating energy and information flow and that's unique so when you say what's different about IP and B nowhere else will you find a definition of the mind and certainly since there is no definition you won't find this definition because there's no definition so in doing that, then we can then take the next step, say, well, if that's a working definition of one part of the mind beyond subjective experience, beyond consciousness, what's a healthy mind? And how would assessment try to feel the texture of a healthy mind or an unhealthy mind? Mm -hmm. And we make a statement about that. We, through long lines of reasoning, and you can read about this in The Developing Mind or other textbooks in the Interpersonal Neurobiology series from Norton, we say that health comes from integration and you and I have had conversations about this at length before, right. but integration is the linkage of differentiated parts and the energy and information flow in your body or the energy and information flow between you and me right now in our relationship are the same essence. So this is the part that throws a lot of people in academics or even in, in uh, other fields that aren't used to thinking in this way energy and information flow energy is the capacity to do stuff it has different forms kinetic energy electrical energy photo you know photon energy um, all sorts of forms of energy the brain the nervous system is basically electrochemical energy flow but all aspects of a relationship ride along patterns of energy flow now sometimes those patterns whether they're in the brain or in our relationship have symbolic value beyond just their pattern and so an energy flow that has symbolic value we call information. So that's what that means. And the word flow just means change across time. So when that flow is integrated, it's harmonious. And you can get a feeling for that in an assessment when a person talks flexibly, when they seem adaptive to what's changing their environment. So the stresses they encounter, the, what's called the allostatic load, the changes in all these ways of homeostasis being... Uh, challenge, you know, my work job changed, uh, kids my kids in school, um, my husband's an alcoholic and he's getting in recovery now and these are all stressors on me. The way you deal with stressors can, can be done with flexibly so you adapt. You can stay what's called coherent, meaning, you know, you have a clear view of what's going on, you see the positives and negatives and you incorporate your ongoing life story in an open, fluid way. That's coherent and you're energized, you have vitality for life, or you're excited to be alive, you're appreciative. Uh, and then you have a kind of dynamic stability uh, where things change as you move along, but generally, you know, you have a sense of not falling off the cliff.